County Science Festival 2020. Uh, my name is Ellen Holstey, if you're just joining us. Our next presentation is What's Up in the Atmosphere by NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador Lisa Winnegar. Good morning, and Ellen, thank you for inviting me to come and speak with you today. I'm here today on behalf of NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I am a volunteer solar system ambassador, which means that I get to go around the country and speak with people about all things that relate to NASA. And I guess if you need to get your passport stamped to go to another planet, I might be the person that can help you out with that. My name is Lisa Weininger, and I not only work for NASA, but I'm also a volunteer. And today we're going to talk a little bit about the Earth's atmosphere and what would happen to you if you started traveling through the layers of the Earth's atmosphere and what kind of safety things NASA has been working on in order to keep their pilots and astronauts safe as they travel away from the Earth's surface and out toward and into space. First of all, one thing we need to know is our planet, like some of the other planets in our solar system, is really a great big ball of rock and water, and it's floating in a big bubble of gases as it moves through space. Well, what would it look like to you if you were traveling away from the Earth's surface? Say you were gonna to travel to the International Space Station, and what would you see as you left Earth and as you were heading out into space? We're going to look at a brief video that tells you what Bob and Doug, who are two astronauts who just traveled on Dragon X up to the International Space Station, saw when they were on their trip. There's nothing more exciting to view than a launch from NASA. You can see the thin layer of atmosphere that protects Earth from space. The cloud patterns on the surface as you leave Earth behind. And if you were to go spacewalking at the ISS, you'd get a completely different view. This view looks like the Earth is upside down, but it's not. This is a view of the island of Fiji. And night shining clouds. Even larger weather patterns can be seen blanketing the Earth's surface from space and lightning everywhere on the planet. Baja, California. And the coast of Africa. This is what cities lit up at night look like from space. And then you would travel back home. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening as you're traveling through the layers of the atmosphere. Because Earth's atmosphere isn't all just one thing. It's layers like layers on a cake, but lots and lots of layers. First of all, we think that the atmosphere is just made up of the part of it that we need to breathe most, which is oxygen. But actually, two thirds of the gases in our atmosphere are nitrogen, 
we don't need them particularly, but plants do. And there are other gases, small amounts, carbon dioxide and argon and water vapor, but that critical amount of oxygen that's in the atmosphere is what we rely upon. Well, the question here is, is if you were to travel up through the layers of the atmosphere, would you always have all of the oxygen that you need to breathe? And would there still be the same amount of gases in the atmosphere at all the different levels? And think about it logically. Gravity is what holds that water to the earth and that's what holds that atmosphere to the earth. So the farther that you get away from earth's surface, there's gonna be a whole lot less gravity. So if we're standing on the Earth's surface, and if we travel up, oh, about 12 kilometers, you're in the part of the atmosphere that's called the troposphere, and that's the part that can support life. There's enough oxygen there to breathe, there's enough air, there's enough gases in the layer to hold up airplanes and hot air balloons, and so that's a pretty livable part. But the farther you head out into space, then the layers get to be very, very different. The next layer up from the troposphere is the stratosphere, and it's very rare, unless you're going to space, to travel through the stratosphere. However, NASA's flying observatory, SOFIA, actually flies through the stratosphere, and I've been on a mission with SOFIA, and it is cold up there, and you still need to wear an oxygen mask even if you're inside the flying observatory. Above that is the mesosphere, the thermosphere, and when you get out to the exosphere, you're in very, very low Earth gravity. And what that means is that there's not going to be much gravity to hold the atmosphere close. You're almost on the very edge of space. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on when we do an experiment with um, air pressure. But if you're in the exosphere, the only thing that's going to be moving out of it are going to be um, spacecraft that we send away from Earth into that area, the International Space Station in low Earth orbit um, in the exosphere. And sometimes you'll see meteorites and other things coming toward the Earth through the exosphere. But it's not going to be a place that you really want to hang out in unless you're really, really well protected or you're in a spacecraft. So think about this. You're standing on the Earth's surface, and, and we talk about uh, the Earth's surface. Let's say the lowest place you can stand on the Earth is um, at sea level. So you're standing by the shore, and Michigan is not that far um, above sea level. So at that level, the weight of all the gas in the atmosphere is pressing down on you with about 14.7 pounds of pressure per square inch on every single part of you. And that's the fronts and the backs and everything that you can feel. But we don't feel it. So if we were uh, like squashed like this poor little rubber ducky here, you know, we would think that we would feel this air pushing on us. But you don't really feel the air pushing on you. One way you can is if you were to blow air from your lips and blow it onto your hand, and you'd be pushing that air a little bit farther or a little bit harder. And that way you would actually feel air pressure. But we don't feel it because we're standing on Earth's surface and our bodies have adjusted to this 14.7 pounds of pressure per square inch on every single part of us. So we just don't feel it. We're great standing on Earth's surface. But what would happen if you or to travel up through the layers of the atmosphere and you were to kind of end up in the hmm, exosphere, you didn't have an airplane around you, you didn't have a flying observatory, you didn't have a space capsule, and you didn't have a special suit like the person in this illustration is wearing. The farther that you got away from Earth's surface and you travel, traveled up through the troposphere, air molecules would be farther and farther apart because there's less gravity holding them down tightly to the Earth's surface. And so one thing with less air in the atmosphere, there's less molecules for the sun to warm and it would be a lot colder. And obviously if you get farther away and the atmosphere gets thinner, there's going to be less oxygen there for you to breathe. And so you're gonna find it very hard to breathe. And if you were to continue even farther out, the farthest you went, eventually you'd get into space. And not only would there be no air there for you to breathe, but you wouldn't have anything exerting pressure on you. So nothing pushing on you from the outside. And that would present a real problem because there would be pressure on the inside of you from everything 
everything that's in you, like your muscles and your blood and your bones and all your tissues. Um, but there would be nothing pushing down on that. No 14.7 pounds per square inch to push back. And that would not be a very pretty picture if you were pushing from the outside, inside out and nothing pushing from the outside in. So one of the things that we do as solar system ambassadors is we've done a little experiment where we try to say what would happen to you if we put you in that environment where there was no pressure pushing on the outside of you. Now, that would be incredibly dangerous to do to a person. So instead, we've used our brave peep marshmallow astronaut volunteers, and we have put them into this experiment. They're used to it. They do it quite a lot, but they kind of stand up like what would happen to a person if they were in this situation. So we're going to look at an experiment that shows what happens if you take away all that air that's pressing down on you all the time, and then what happens with all that pressure that's pushing from the inside out. So when there is no air pressure, we're going to experiment with, with peeps in space. And this experiment is presented by my good friend, April Anat from Wings Over the Rockies Museum in Denver. Denver's a little different than Barry County because Denver is almost a mile above sea level, which means that there's already less pressure there. But we're gonna try some different experiments with these peeps to find out what happens to you if you were to go up into the space with no space suit on, or what would happen to all the liquid in you, and what would happen um, if you were to wear a suit? So let's have a look. Pressure here than we would have down at sea level. So at sea level, we have 14.7 pounds per square inch of air pressure pushing on our bodies all the time. Here in Denver, we have about 12 pounds per square inch pushing on our bodies. The reason I talk about that is because I want to show you what happens to the human body when we have less and less air pressure pushing on us until the point that we can't survive any longer. So here I'm going to take this marshmallow peep and I'm going to show you what would happen if you were going to go up high into Earth's atmosphere or into space without a suit on. So I'm going to take this little marshmallow peep here and I'm going to send it up high into Earth's atmosphere by putting it in a bell jar here where I'm going to take away the air pressure. So what you'll see when I turn this on and there's no more air pressure pushing on this peep is that this peep here starts to expand. This would be you if you didn't have a suit on or if you weren't in a space capsule. Now, this marshmallow peep won't stay big forever and neither would you. And that's because the peep has a lot of little pores where the air would leak out. The air would also leak out of your body. Actually, you would only survive for about 90 seconds. So what you'll see here is that the peep is starting to shrink back down as all the air pressure leaves its body. Air pressure is also gone from the outside of the peep. So it's at an equilibrium, but not one that you would be able to survive. So when I bring you back down to normal air pressure, and here in Denver, we have about 12.06 pounds per square inch pushing on our bodies. Again, we don't normally feel it unless all the air is outside of our body. So when I reintroduce air to this container, what you'll see is that same air pressure that we didn't feel just a minute ago would crush us. So this is what would happen to you if you were gonna go up high into Earth's atmosphere or out into space without a suit on. To show you how this works, I have another peep that's also inside a bottle right here, and I'm going to take a fresh peep and send it up. The peep that's in here, once I take all the air out again, is not going to expand while the other one does. And that's because it's in a fully enclosed container. The air pressure is still inside that bottle with the lid on, but yet there's no air pressure on this other peep, allowing it to expand. Again, this would be you without a suit on, and this would be you with a suit on. We'll take you back down to normal air pressure. Yikes! And you will see that this peep is fully intact while this one has been crushed by the air pressure. But my personal so this is what happens is to you without your suit on. Now, that's not the only thing that happens because you're also made up of a lot of water. So here I have a bottle of water. It's just at regular room temperature. You are mostly three quarters water. So what happens to the water in your body if we go up without a space suit on or without any kind of pressure is that you'll see this water here in a minute starting to boil. Right now, water doesn't boil at room temperature because there's air pressure pushing down on it, keeping it from boiling. 
Typically when we boil water, we add heat to the bottom, which increases its energy, right? Allowing it to overcome the air pressure. However, if we just take away the air pressure, keeping it from boiling, what you'll see is that water has enough energy inside it to boil on its own. This would be all the water inside of your body if you were to go above about 55,000 feet, which is known as Armstrong's line, all the water in your body would boil. Now, well, that does not sound like a good plan for all the water in your body to boil. So we just saw from that experiment that if you were to go up above about 55,000 feet, first of all, all the air would leak out of you because there's no pressure from the outside holding it in. And secondly, all of the liquids that were in you would boil. And that would start with your eyes and your mouth and your nose because they're kind of dry and you would have the worst case of dry mouth ever and you would last about 90 seconds. So how does NASA get around that particular problem? Well, first of all, we would never send any astronaut or pilot into space without the proper protective gear and that isn't a water bottle. What you need is you need a pressure suit. So if you're a pilot flying very high into the atmosphere, you need one kind. If you're an astronaut, you need a, a, a separate kind of pressure suit. Um, first of all, the pressure suit is completely sealed and you get the air that you need to breathe from a tank. Secondly, what will happen is your suit will puff up and it will exert pressure on you from inside the suit. So it'll feel really, really tight around you, but that will hold everything that's on the inside of you inside so that it doesn't start to leak out. It makes up for the lack of pressure on the outside of you in the atmosphere. It keeps you warm or cold, depending on whether you need to be warm or cold. And there's even a way to eat if you put a big tube through your helmet and you squeeze some goopy food into that tube right into your mouth. So um, another way that NASA has been working on this problem of pressure has to do with not too little pressure, but what happens if there's too much pressure? And one of the places on our planet where you're going to experience that is if you go diving under the ocean. Now you can go diving to a certain depth just wearing a scuba suit, um, but remember all the weight of that water um, on top of you is going to press on you and press on you and squish you a little bit. And if you've ever gone to the bottom of the swimming pool and had the pressure in your ears pop, you'll know that there's something pushing on you. But what if you want to go very deep into Earth's uh, ocean and you want to um, find out if you can do that without a submarine? Well, NASA has created, in conjunction with some other agencies, has created a suit that's wearable, that is like a mini submarine that goes around you. And if you're in that suit, it protects you from the pressure of the water and it also has pressure on the inside. And it's kind of like swimming around in your own private submarine. So in case you wonder what NASA is doing, NASA is doing a lot of new things that relate to taking people farther out into space than we've ever been before. The Artemis generation, which is basically students that are in late middle school and high school, are gonna be the first member of that astronaut corps who are going to probably be traveling not only to a base on the moon, but also onto Mars. So I wanna end with a little bit of a video view of what NASA has done in the past and what we're going to be working on for you in the future. Ignition sequence start. All engines up. We have taken tremendous steps. We choose to go to the moon before this decade is out. We have achieved the earth shaking, the breathtaking, the groundbreaking. One small step for man. And left a mark in the heavens. Our successes build one upon another and amplify what is possible. The dawn of Orion. It's time we take the next great leap. We're building the next chapter of American exploration, returning to the moon to stay, so we can go beyond to Mars, to expand what's possible and further our understanding. The 
architecture for these missions is already taking shape. We will go with new systems, bold designs, and a sustainable mission. You can hear it, taste it, touch it. We are going. We are training, testing, pressing our pioneering spirit into every component, defining our resolve with every line of code, and securing our success with every welcomed partnership. This is not hypothetical. This is not about flags and footprints. This is about sustainable science and feeding forward the advance of the human spirit. Because we are the pioneers, the star sailors, the thinkers, the visionaries, the doers. And because we stand on the shoulders of the giants to go farther than humanity has ever been, we will add our names to the roles of the greatest adventurers in history. Every day, every mission, we advance this call. We are NASA. And after 60 years, we're just getting started. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation today. And I'm going to switch over and see whether or not there we have any questions that need to be answered. So thank you so much for your presentation, Lisa. I do have to say my peep is not happy with that peep <laughs> experiment. <laughs> yes, I feel sad for all the peeps. Uh, so if you are joining us on Facebook Live, feel free to put in your questions in the comments. But I do have a comment on Facebook Live. Uh, Karen says, that is fascinating experiment with the peeps, especially because the sugar shows the expansion. Nice job. That's very true. And the cool part is there's many different shapes of peeps. And I've had a lot of luck with the Easter Bunny peep looking ones because they're shaped more like people. So they tend to expand and contract the way people do. Exactly. Oh, we do have a question on Facebook. Uh, our question is, how did you become a NASA ambassador? I'm oh, that's a, <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Anybody who has any expertise in astronomy or space science or even has just done any like work teaching or worked for NASA can apply for the Solar System Ambassador Program through the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Right now, there are 10,000 solar system ambassadors. And our whole job is to travel around and uh, have fun and to teach people about space science and about aeronautics and about the kind of work that NASA does. And it is absolutely enjoyable. So if you're somebody who has that kind of background and you're interested, I can give you any information that you need. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Lisa. I think that's about all we have time for, for today. But I know I learned a lot and I'm pretty sure everyone else did too. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ellen. Bye. Bye.